Welcome to Beyond the Lair. Our guest today is Tamara Goddard, President for of Four Economics and General Manager of Ethel Haltsey Facilities Management. We discuss entrepreneurism, technology, living with a superpower, and preserving and protecting our Indigenous language and arts. everybody. Welcome to Beyond the Lair, where we talk to entrepreneurs that are making a social impact in community, and their life purpose is to empower and better Indigenous lives, and also organizations, corporations, and businesses that are doing the same and making a social impact in community and improving and elevating Indigenous lives. My name is Gina Jackson Montgomery Satasia from the Seashelt Nation, and... I'm Dean Montgomery. And we are so honored to have one of our bestest, closest friends, Tamara Goddard, who exemplifies everything that we introduced, which is the whole persona and mandate of the Bears Lair. So welcome, Tamara Goddard. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me here. It's so nice to see you because we don't see each other otherwise. No, (laughs) we don't. We have to get on a podcast to do so. This actually isn't a podcast. This is just us getting together. There there it is. (laughs) Yeah. You have such a good podcast voice. Well, radio voice. Well, thank you very smooth. much. Yeah, it's smooth, isn't it? Very smooth. <laughs> have you done podcasts before, Tamara? Uh, I have. I've done quite a few. Oh. But but not with my podcast. That's the first time anybody has ever said, hey, you've got a good podcast voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's excellent. So today we want to get to know a little bit about what you're doing because you're up to some really exciting um, achievements right now and some and some great um planning for Indigenous entrepreneurs and the the shift that you've had from the very beginning of your career as an entrepreneur to the paradigm shift of technology that is out of this universe, literally, um, we really want to learn and build up to that. But where we have to start is learning about you. Who is Tamara Goddard? Um, we can talk about a little bit later how we met, the three of us met, but what led you up to going into and becoming an entrepreneur from the very humble beginnings? Jeez, that's a big question. I believe my first business was selling my homework in um, in junior high school, to be honest with you. So <laughs> I think I've always been entrepreneurial minded. I think that um, and, and, you know, I'll take one step aside. One of the reasons why I, I looked at the world differently was because I have something called synesthesia. And so synesthesia is, I, I suppose they might name that as part of a neurodiversity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but it's basically a connection of the senses. And so because my senses were connected, I was viewing the world differently than people around me. So at a very, and also um, I like to take very deep dives and very analytical. So even as a child... Um, I thought, and I grew up outside of my community to boot, so I I didn't have the reference uh, whereby this would have been a biological condition that most of my family likely has. Um, But growing up outside of the community, I viewed the world differently, and outside of an Indigenous community as well, I became obsessed with systems. I could not understand sort of what was going on socially uh, within the people around me that were raising me. They were lovely people. I was extremely lucky to be raised by by the people that did raise me. Um, but I found that, yeah, I just found that people were struggling in who, the, who they were and uh, the school systems. So that was my obsession was systems. And that actually led to pretty much everything in my life that I've ever done is 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 complex systems, simple systems. Uh, in my earlier days, I, I did systems of the physics of color, for example, to understand how color spoke to people. Because with my synesthesia, I, I see patterns in colors and sound has a color and so, so different things. Wow. Well, can you tell us, like, so how did you grow up? It sounds like, so you were, what, let us know, like, what was it like or where you? Where, where did you grow up? Yeah, I grew up um, just in Delta. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was adopted by a really great family, one of the very lucky uh, young Indigenous people to to be adopted. And they got me within within three months, actually, of being born. Uh, and they will say, like Barb, my, bio, my mother, <clears throat> she will say, looking back, that I was a bit of a different child. And back then, they didn't have any of the tools necessary 
um, to be able to reconnect me back with my culture or to connect me in with something like synesthesia, which has really only recently been been diagnosed and, and not diagnosed, but been studied. And right now they're just looking at how synesthesia creates colors around words and very small things, nothing to the magnitude of what I've experienced hmm. or experience. Mm-hmm. And then, so you, <clears throat> those are your adoptive parents and then, you're, what Did you find out what nation you're from? And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So my biological mother, uh, Dr. Val Napoleon, um, located me when I was about 19 years old, actually. And that was a momentous occasion for me. Uh, we wound up having a baby shower uh, up north um, in, in Hazleton. And so that was... And she took me home. Uh, we went on the Alaska Highway all the way up to Alaska. She introduced me uh, to peoples along the way from various nations. And so I began to relearn my culture and relearn the land uh, at 19 years old. And you're a very proud member of the Soto First Nation. Yes, GDA, yes, from yeah. the Soto First Nation. Uh, the First Nation I was introduced to, of course, was the Gitsan Nation. And my mother had been working with them on their territory for many years. So she uh, was adopted into the frog clan there. And mm-hmm. so that was the first place I stayed was with the Gitsan people. And then we went home to the Soto Nation. Oh my God, we love working with the Soto Nation, as you know. Yes, we've done so I much. do know that. Yeah, yeah. So, so great. Absolutely. And I am the frog clan. And yes. I am the frog clan. So is Candy Campo, which is one of our best friends as well. That's right. So how, how did you get diagnosed with something like that? Um, because I wouldn't even, having children of my own, um, I wouldn't even know how to recognize something like that. No, I, I learned because my, my, both my sons have the same disorder. And so my youngest son will tilt his head to the side to see you better. And so it, it, it came about by watching them and then reflecting on my own experience. Uh, and then I had some near, um, some autoimmune things going on that the doctors didn't understand. And at the end of the day, they wound up understanding that because my senses are constantly overloaded from the synesthesia, that I was having an overloaded uh, neurological system, which is causing some of my swelling and and issues with my uh, autoimmune. So did this lead to your entrepreneurial spirit? Absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Again, looking at things differently, I I look at patterns. And so, um, so I'm always trying to uh, communicate in terms of patterns, a very complex view of mathematics, like being able to write out colors in, in, in terms of physics and sound, etc. And so every system, uh, system of economics is simply a pattern. And so I was always extremely fascinated with how patterns affect people uh, and how people are, are impacted by the systems that are guiding them. And therefore, what are the gaps? And so for 20 years, really, um, the last 20 years has been my job to identify the gaps between uh, in the business community between Indigenous peoples, governments, and industry. Yeah, so interesting. I mean, I've seen you do it and seen you and Gina do it together, actually. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think the entrepreneurial spirit, seeing that in people, uh, needing to go a direction on one's own um, and, and being incredibly inspired by other people. Um, that were also bringing their heart and their ideas into this world. And that's essentially how Gina and I met when I was at Tallahout Aboriginal Capital Corporation. That's right. And I had my own company, which was uh, called Western Spirit Hot Tub and Spa. And Tamira was a business uh, coach, liaison in charge of um, uh, business plans and just being a mentor for uh, Indigenous people in business and and really seeing their gifts and and helping advance their businesses. And that's how we became fast friends. And then from there, you left Telhout and I went to go work for the Squamish Nation, um, but still maintained our friendship and, and never met a person that is more um, fast and furious at grant writing or sees business in an absolute different way. And what may look chaotic to other people is absolutely sound inside the brain. And and um, and I feel a synergy not to that. I, I mean, when you focus on something, you laser focus on something. And and we had a we had an initiative together for C SPAN. When uh, we were working for the, when I was working for the Squamish Nation, and that was to try to get people involved in economic development and procurement before the 
um, before the construction of the shipbuilding for the two non-combat ships that were awarded and and Squamish and Slate Latouth had given their letter of um, support for this. And what did you call it? We did a we did an information session for C-SPAN. I believe that that was you, Gina, and it yeah. was get your ship together. And everybody <laughs> loved that. <laughs> and again, the entrepreneurial spirit, because people had just become tired of the humdrum and what are we talking about and what are we doing and get your ship together, give everybody a laugh. And when people laugh and when people get excited, great things happen. Yeah, you remember it too. Right? Yeah, you remember it. And you talk and about it. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, and relationship-based, mm-hmm. You know, uh, we had so many events that just brought relationships together. And Dean, I know you know how important that is. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was why that project succeeded and uh, and those events were everything. And fundraisers. Uh, I know that we had planned uh, the Day Scholars um, fundraiser to raise capital for um, for putting together the class action suit. Correct. Uh, for the government, which has now been awarded for $2.8 billion dollars. So I think at that event, we raised about $140,000 to put towards that actual initial application for the class action suit. So yay, um, that has that has gone through into fruition and, and making a difference. So just making a social impact and everything that you're doing and we're doing and then and then pass diverse and then they cross again. And you started in a business um, called For Our Future. Mm-hmm. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about that and how that started and what the premise is about it? Yeah, For Our Future came after I, I worked for the Squamish Nation. And so, and and of course, you were at the Squamish Nation. You know, I just want to add too, before I speak about that, the events that we had were, were, were different in themselves because what we did was we brought people onto reserve. And we, if you'd remember, it, it would co- I think it costed sixty thousand dollars to transform uh, the Chief Joe Mathias mm-hmm. Center into a, a gala, gala with crystal chairs and yeah, you guys did an amazing job, an amazing, yeah. right? But every single contractor that serviced those events was Indigenous, as well as all of the artists who didn't just donate, but they were paid. And we, so they were paid fair co- fair price for the art auctions, and then anything above that went to the cause. And so I, I want to add that those are the kinds of th- things that are different about about the way I think we put business together. For Our Future uh, came about after my work at Squamish Nation, where you were working with the small businesses and I was working with uh, with Chief Gibby Jacob. Yeah. And so we went through, I think, about 350 corporations for partnerships for several of the projects on the Squamish Nation territory and developed a, a whole system uh, for being able to, to select partners, uh, due diligence process, et cetera, uh, moving forward, as well as unique uh, unique negotiations to ensure that all projects on Squamish Nation territory were considering um, procuring with Squamish Nation businesses. And that happened way before it was really overly popular or mandated as it is now to to increase Indigenous spend. And so Squamish Nation was was leading the way with that. I think that's a way that Dean and myself and... Absolutely. Dean, uh, you were a partner with uh, the Squamish Nation, one of the first partners um, that developed, uh, that came in. And this is is what's really interesting about Indigenous people working for industry as well as really setting up a nation for success. And when we did the initial bid for Get Your Ship Together and there were all these opportunities... It wasn't dialed in, and in a vetting process wasn't developed yet. And how do we develop um, our core values? And what is our synergy with businesses that we want to do business with? And do they share our same core values? And are we going to do a JV and LP or preferred partnership? And I think when Dean came in um, and sat as a not as not as a consultant, just as a good partner to give us the infrastructure and foundation for doing that, yeah, it allowed us to be able to develop the directory. And as a nation, what is the importance, do you think, of a nation to be set up and have experts like that? Because I know that we can sit and when I've heard this being, as you have, working for Squamish and other nations where BC Hydro or Fortis or other big industry leaders or wood fiber LNG, which was just a whisper at that time, working with Squamish, want to do the right thing. They want to support entrepreneurism and they want to support partnerships. But if a nation isn't dialed in and if you don't create a space for it to be easy for the proponents or partnerships, then 
you're setting yourself up for failure. What are the secrets that you could give to nations or economic developments to set yourself up for success so that they can engage and participate in business the way that Squamish has? You know, one of the best things that, that came out of all the research was was four general pillars, and then Chief Gibby fed into that, as well as yourself, Dean, and Gina. So I'd say it was a collective uh, bringing into the four pillars. And, and so the four pillars are looking at uh, what type of employment and career training are on the nations, how is the land affected by the nations, uh, is culture being considered in the nations, and is small business and procurement being considered. And so those four pillars are important for a nation to develop their own pillars, for one, but those pillars should be present at every single meeting that you're ever having with major projects, with government, with industry partners, um, and with business partners. Um, because if you're not addressing those four key aspects, then you're not addressing the, the ability for a nation to truly grow roots yep. and be able to, to share and prosper for several generations. Now, the entrepreneur in a First Nation are usually the most, um, I don't know what the right term is, they're, they're, the, they're the up and coming you know, a business is, is as good as the, the leader of that business. And and nations, when they they have oftentimes, they've, they're, they're governing uh, their own nation. Uh, what they need is somebody extremely savvy and, and with a lot of business sense and a lot of business acumen in the seat building their businesses. And that business needs to fully and completely understand the, the, the community. I don't like to use the term needs, but the community to desire to, to reflect who they are and to reconnect with yeah. who they are. And it's, and it's totally cyclical, right? You, yeah. you, you get that going and it, and yeah. it spawns others and oh, lets, absolutely. lets people be mentors and teachers. And, yeah. You know, it's... It, we, we negotiate a lot of employment, for example, and, mm. and employment is, is good, but historically it's been a lot of, um, d- there's been a lot of difficulty getting to the upper level management and a lot of uh, trouble with c- large corporations retaining the talent uh, available in the nations. Where the talent is, res- is retained and what should always be considered in employment is self-employment because you're creating employment and, and the, av- the First Nations businesses on average will employ 70% uh, community members and other Indigenous people, and they will also invest more uh, into the training, and that will be more mentorship-style training, and they have bigger opportunities to to, to step into those larger uh, management roles. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think you know, one thing that doesn't get recognized about entrepreneurship is that, you know, everyone has to try to be an entrepreneur, and it, it doesn't always work out, and we certainly all fail at some point, right? Yeah. And typically, we'll, we'll go back and we'll work for a company. But until you've actually failed and found out how difficult it is yeah when you work for a company you become a better employee right because you, you take ownership you do of your job right i i, I think uh, that's really important something i certainly learned yeah and I, the, the most sought after um skill right now is creativity and innovation so it's mm-hmm. the ability to solve problems on the fly and put things together mm-hmm. really quickly mm-hmm. and so everybody absolutely um, should be should be studying entrepreneurship and, and just giving it a go mm-hmm no, I agree. Absolutely. And we all yo-yo from being an entrepreneur, especially at our age right now, being an entrepreneur and then this roller coaster of just the mental roller coaster that that goes with being an entrepreneur, whether it's self-doubt, the risk, um, sacrifice, those and but with that comes these wins that you have where when you're high, you're high, and when you're low, you're low, and this whole roller coaster and the the type of individual you have to be to be able to see it through. And I know the three of us have been entrepreneurs, and then maybe things haven't worked out for one reason or another, and then we get a secure job, and we're like, whew, okay, well, we got a steady paycheck, we know where everything is coming from, and then, but still in in our soul and in our stomach, we know we should be doing something entrepreneurial and you have that safety spot for a while and then you see a gap in something that you can make a difference with all of your experience and everything that you take with you. And I think the entrepreneurial spirit, once you're an entrepreneur, you will always be an entrepreneur. It's nice to work for people, but when you start identifying systems that can be improved and and gaps in in, in industry then you're going back to going what you should be doing again. So Yeah, and I think, you know, and again, when you, when you have your challenges, right, and, and you start something over, but you never quit, 
right? That's, I think that's the golden rule. For, Absolutely. Is never, ever quit. Right? Yeah, entrepreneurship is the mm-hmm. art of falling down and getting back up. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the resiliency that you, that you have to have is sometimes you have to fail in order to learn those hard lessons no, definitely. and manage risk. Yeah. It, there's so many risks that you can never see coming. Yeah, it's a great, I love the great, it was a proverb, um, every failure is a seed to success. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And we, well, for our future, you started that. Let's talk about that a little bit. And then we can talk about um, no option to fail, right? Like yeah. taking on a business and there is no option to fail because you have staff looking at you, you have people looking at you, you're at a platform where on stage per se and whatever level you're at. And what does that take? Tell us about For Our Future and what that stands for. And For Our Future is F-O-U-R, so it's referring to the four pillars. Um, so so that was with, with some partners, Chief Gibby uh, being one of them at the time before he, he re- retired, retired, sort of retired. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, but so so it was really bringing his leadership in into that role because it was a bit nerve-wracking. Um, the reason why it was nerve-wracking is because um, I, I didn't mention, so when I was 19, I had a actual dream, a complicated dream, a, a Tamara dream, and it was of a new economic system. Um, that, but it was an economic system that was based in the growth patterns of nature, and uh, it, was, it was so complex it actually would make me dizzy. And so the, the, all of the research I've done is sort of leading backwards to, is that possible to have an economic system uh, that is multi-pronged? And for our future was the launching of that economic system. Um, and so that's why it was nerve-wracking, and that's why I reached out for partners and uh, to have support with that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and really what For Our Future did was, was explore, uh, did some more exploration industry to industry. So we worked with, um, you know, forestry. I think we did, oh, no, C-SPAN wasn't under that, or, or the shipbuilding. Uh, but we did every major industry, LNG, et cetera. And, and we would go in and, and look at the over art, like the entire system. So when people say systemic racism, I would just call that regulatory oppression. Um, and, and it's regulated because, uh, you know, what I would do is I would go region to region, say it's forestry, and I would be working between the government and the First Nations. And we would listen and listen and listen until we heard key themes. And then we would take those key themes and we would go backwards with those key themes and say, okay, we've got eight key themes in every single region. What is happening in the regulatory environment that's causing these, this feedback uh, to be happening? And then we would identify through the regulatory process where the pinch points were, where the agreements were, um, and then we would bring that back um, to leadership. Uh, could be the AFN, the First Nation, the governments, and it would really just zone in on where they needed to look at uh, to make change. Mm-hmm. So to create systems to make the experience yeah, to change, better. Exactly, to change critical policy within systems that were simply not working, um, not only just for First Nations, but they're just not working for, for the mom and pop, the regular citizen. Um, they're, they're too big, and oftentimes governments are become specialists in the, regulatory, the regulations that they, that they are working with, so they're not looking at how is this impacting entrepreneurs in general or First Nations or, or business owners in Canada. So I think the research that we did really brought that back um, to help them look at things differently, which is essentially the basis of what we do. Well, I, w- I always laugh because I think of, I just have visions of you with with those stick-on big post-its with all of this <laughs> research, just looking at it like um, Russell Crowe and Beautiful Mind. And just like, mm-hmm, all of it come together, <laughs> carry the seven times pi <laughs> equals aha, uh-huh, and then just start writing. And um, and it all comes back to what you're talking about, yeah. to your superpower. Yeah. Right? And um and and where you're going with that and what your achievements are. And then from there you did four hundred drums. So we launched 400 Drums because, um, A, the pandemic, and all of a sudden every single Indigenous business needed to go uh, and provide their services digitally. Uh, and so, and then the other part was the auntie and me kind of kicked in with all my downtown east side youth, so you know how that was at my house. And we challenged them to make a multi-sensory experience of Indigenous art and culture that could be showcased online and sold online. And... Along with that, at the same time, we had we were doing national research on on procurement systems, um, in regard to the government trying to obtain, like trying to reach five percent indigenous procurement goals in Canada, 
And so we wrote the national strategy for that and researched internationally the role of techno- that technology was playing in other countries and where Canada was at. And we were way behind. So most other countries were already utilizing um, other systems because they're called Web 3.0 systems, uh, AI um, you know, I'm already into quantum computing, but uh, I would say AI and blockchain uh, had taken over systems as uh, as ways of improving ledger systems um, for transparency within the supply chain. And so what happened there is I recognized that this complicated, um, it, it, it actually simplifies things, but the, but the vision I had when I was 19 could be used, like it could be put into technology now. And so for the first time ever in my entire life, all the complexities in my mind could be put into technology. And, and that is where for what 400 Drums was. So it was first just an NFT project. We did an Indigenous NFT project. Um, and it, it went well and we learned a ton. Uh, but the, probably the most important thing that we learned through that exercise is that blockchain is not cryptocurrency Blockchain is a, is a technology unto itself, and we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so all of the technology, and we've developed four of them uh, in partnership with other technology companies, has been based on, on that idea of, of to use blockchain for the full power that it has. Maybe you can explain to you, um, to our viewers and to our listeners, number one, what NFT is, what NFT is, what blockchain is, what that kind of quantum technology is. And where we're going, I know that a lot of our listeners know what crypto is because you hear it and there it's in a lot of video games, et cetera. But this is something real that exists now and that is coming in the future and is evolving as we know it. So maybe you could just explain a little bit what that oh, means. Yeah, 100%. I'll do in, indigenous style. So blockchain. I'm, I'm going to listen yeah. intently because our son is currently <laughs> trading it. Yeah, yes. and, and he's well, talking yeah. about it really. Yes. Well, he's yeah. he's trading in crypto, so that I'm not <clears throat> going to talk about cryptocurrency okay. because okay. that that is in the hands of of people bigger than me. But what's not in the hands, mm. and this is where everybody who's an entrepreneur needs to understand, what's not out of our hands is the technology of blockchain. Blockchain is just what it says it is. It's a block of digital information, uh, and and so so let's say that I want to copyright uh, a curriculum or a piece of art or I want to embed my Indigenous lineage to, to a language program. Well, I can take that and digitally mark it into a block. And then every time I share that or every time it is shared uh, out, out in the World Wide Web, uh, it's, it's recognized. So every transaction is another block in the chain. And so, so you can understand that if I uh, create a piece of art and I blocked, I put uh, a digital signature. We call it the Indigi seal. So we created the Indigi seal and we did that with a fintech company. So we actually take a person's indigenous lineage and we create a digital, I think uh, uh, my CEO calls it a digital safe. It creates that digital safe and, and, and information is put in there about your lineage and about the product or service that, that you've created. So does that monetize it then? Yeah. Yeah, well, it so allows it for all sorts of monetization. So now I've, I've got, say, three words that a video game wants to use. It's is blockchain, so that means that's a product that I can be automatically uh, paid for immediately. Um, so uh, through what's called a smart contract. Hmm. Yeah. But we use it. We used it first of all in art, and so and so we wanted to connect the digital with the physical, and we wanted to do that as much for our youth as, as anything. So we would do a public art installation. Um, the artist would be commissioned. Uh, the corporation would buy it. Uh, we would install it into a building, and then we put a QR code um, there. So we would protect that image uh, using blockchain copyright, which we've mm-hmm. developed uh, with one of our partners. And so now it's copywritten. Um, so it's installed publicly, and then we create limited edition prints. And those limited edition prints then essentially uh, go to sale to corporations across Canada. So now the artist has been commissioned and paid up front to produce a, uh, one piece of art. We've created an additional 800 limited edition prints that they're going to get automatically smart contracted on uh, every time a print sells. Wow. And there's no administration that needs to go on there every time it sells. Um it goes out. And there's nothing physical? Uh, no, there is a physical. In, in our program, there's, all, there's a physical. There's a physical. Uh, where there wouldn't be a, phys- there's a physical piece of art that is sold. Yeah. 
Okay, the, the fact that it's uh, copywritten on the blockchain it inscribes a signature to every limited edition print. So it protects the buyer because they know that an Indigi seal accompanies yeah. the piece of art that they've purchased, mm -hmm. and they know automatically that the ori originator, the artist, has been properly compensated. Okay, so it's authentic. It's authentic. Yeah. yeah. Wow, and how does... Wow, this is so interesting. So if you're an artist that's listening and you want to be involved in this and you make this amazing original piece of art, but then you also want to do limited editions and you don't have the access to any kind of technology that's probably blowing people's minds right now with this conversation, but how do they advertise? How do they get in touch with you? How do they get their piece of art there? How did they learn more about this program? Because, it, and how successful has it been? Um, well, it's, it's been very successful. One of our most successful projects is for the company that I work for now. So I, I have a job in the private sector uh, for Ethla Halsey. And so what we did was we brought four artists uh, together. They created four four pieces of commissioned pieces of art uh, called the Four Sacred Medicines. So it was our Four Sacred Medicines. And the carpet Canadian Carpet Manufacturing Company created a line of commercial carpets inspired by these pieces of art. And so... So that's what created the limited edition prints. And as the commercial carpets sell, um, they also get a limited edition print. So the artist is paid every time a commercial carpet is installed anywhere uh, in Canada or the world. So that was one of our very successful projects there. Um, <clears throat> and we, so now at, at the company I work for now, Ethla Haltzi, who, who will be continuing to work with what's now for economics, um, we will continue to work with artists whereby I, I think we're bidding a couple um, projects at the border crossing right now. And so, again, we would pay the artist uh, border crossing. It's probably be a semi-ammo artist. Uh, we will copyright their work. We will create limited edition prints, and then we will bring those limited edition prints through my current company, Ethla Haltzi, who's partnered with a facilities management company with 120 interior designers across Canada and 26,000 buildings that they manage. Well, so I'm guessing the transactions happen very quickly too, right? So within the supply chain, like cash is probably moving much quicker. It or, will. Yeah. It will. I just started this position uh, with Ethel Halsey, and the reason I took this position is because is I realized, oh my goodness, this company is managing, in terms of 5% Indigenous procurement, they're managing 26,000 facilities across Canada, including 6,000 government facilities. Mm -hmm. And so every single one of those facilities wants to increase their Indigenous spend. And so, right. you know, art, um, public art, mm -hmm. is, is a huge contribution to that. And so, so artists can get a hold of me. Um, I am very interested to, to to know who they are and have a, a um, and and curate work from across Canada, basically, so that our clients can go into the marketplace, which we also developed a decentralized marketplace um, called, which is called, in DigiHub. We developed a marketplace called DigiHub, so now corporations can come directly to that marketplace and purchase indigenous arts, crafts, uh, coffee, foods directly. And why is it decentralized? It's decentralized because um, part of our research indicated that indigenous people are the most researched people in Canada and our data is very valuable. Mm. So what it is is that the entire marketplace is encrypted. And so when you enter the marketplace, you can come in by subscription with a corporation and we can actually produce custom analytics for every corporation so that we can show them how their indigenous spend has, has gone uh, per quarter. Mm -hmm. they, they reported report out per quarter how many indigenous contractors they used, how many secondary indigenous businesses so, gained. So it's, it's, it's their own data center. It's their own data center, right. and there's no leakage in that because right. it is decentralized. Okay. So you are actually encrypted the moment you are in the database. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. And then the indigenous person enters the um, space uh, mm -hmm. by having an Indigi seal assigned to them. So that means that we've gone through all the protocol necessary to deem that this is indeed an Indigenous business or an Indigenous uh, artist or language speaker. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. And you're not uh, just a savvy businesswoman. You are also an artist. Oh, yeah. Are you ever? Yes. So maybe you can talk uh, about your mediums of art and when you started and what your proudest accomplishment is and how you relate to the artists and in, in your way of thinking because I know and we'll we'll talk about the kids camps and the bears lair and your participation in this but the way that you uh, relate 
to to people and bringing out the beauty that uh, from a scholastic or academic level is is totally different. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, you know, art art is our way of embedding our our not like language knowledge of the land in our law. Uh, it's it's in, either embedded on the land as art, say in 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 sometimes what we might call a modified tree, or it, or it might be a totem pole, which were meant to be put up and then meant to actually decay back into the lands, uh, in in some nations. So, I don't believe that there can be indigenous economy if we are not per, uh, preserving the language and the art of that community. And already there's been such a loss of which artistic style belongs with na- which nation. You're so we're so lucky in British Columbia because um, because because of many of our nations here are unseated, and they they were protected geographically, mm-hmm. but by the mountains and et cetera. So they've really held on to you know Tlingit art looks like this and Haida art looks like that. But back east there's there's a lot of uh, discrepancies between say the Dene, the, the Cree. Uh, the Anishinaabeg, so so it's more difficult back east to tell which art specifically came from which region, and there's a lot of historical reasons for that, and and but mostly uh, there was a lot of migration and movement uh, during times of colonization where we were sort of leaving our different territories and and coming out west, which is why my Soto community is located in British Columbia because we were coming out west to oh. to move away. Yeah, the yeah. great chief. Cam, Ken Cameron yeah. told us an amazing story over dinner of, yeah. the, of the 17 years it took to uh, yeah. get resettled. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And that'll, that'll be a story for another mm-hmm. time. But yeah, we, yeah, there was uh, all, that's a very cool story. Yeah. And that was his great grandfather, I think, that was the leader where people followed him for 18 years or 17 years to get to a location of a vision of the twin sisters. One of our dreamers. Yeah. So in, in our nation, our, our medicine, you would call it dreamers, dreaming. And so uh, and so they say that I'm a dreamer in my nation because of the synesthesia and the dreams and the, and the being separated from the community. And so I had many dreams of the community whilst I was growing up. And so, so yes, yeah, so we had a dreamer. And our dreamer, and I'm going to cut the story to make it very short, but our dreamer brought us here to the Twin Sister Mountains in, in uh, northeastern BC in the Peace River Valley. And lucky for us, there was also a Dene dreamer who had, been, who had known of our arrival. And so what would have normally happened if we came into somebody else's territory is that a war would have ensued. But in our case, the Dene dreamer and our dreamer knew each other from dream time. And so we struck a peace treaty. And so we protect the mountain to the east and they protect the mountain to the west. Yeah, I remember when Gina first heard the story, she said something like, man, can you imagine how like charming this guy must have been to follow him for 17 years? I'd be like, are you sure people? you know where you're going? <laughs> 17 years. Yeah, I we, could, 17 minutes with me following somebody to a location is uh, is an eternity. So I can imagine it's it's such a lovely story. And, um, and I love the whole dreaming aspect of of that. You were a, um, we've worked together for many years. We've known each other for, my goodness, almost maybe almost two decades since we were 10. Yeah. Now that we're 30. That's right. Um, So we worked with entrepreneurs together and developed procurement together, the three of us. And then um, talking about having a TV show for a very long time, not necessarily us doing a TV show, but why isn't there a TV show like the Shark Tank or the Dragon's Den or something like that, 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 um, that it really uplifts in entrepreneurism and, um, and had the opportunity to participate into, we started a show like that and you came on as one of the guest coaches, which we thought was a really important factor to, to this show is, is you need coaches you, we didn't want it to be a show where number one, it was a capitalist and and as and all my hands up and and good relations to those entrepreneur shows that have really trailblazed and given us a voice, no matter what nationality or culture you are, but really wanted something that exemplified our core values and who we are. And coaching and mentoring and support is very important. 
Can you um, talk about your experience on it? Because this was new for all of us. And there was so much generosity of spirit. We did it at, uh, we filmed at my brother Shane Jackson's shop. It was during a pandemic. Um, no experience whatsoever. Just go in, all chips in. Train um, going by on the reserve. Yeah, train going by. <laughs> lots and uh, lots of trains going just, by. <laughs> Um, what was it like to work with those entrepreneurs that really did put their, all their chips in because they did come out during a pandemic risking their health because it was so unknown at the time of how contagious COVID was and people That's were right. um, losing their lives left, right and center and taking, coming and then going back into the community where elders are exposed and just the unknown of it all. Um, but really believing in, in what they were doing and believing enough in themselves to come out and, and audition for something like this. What was your experience with them and what was most of your advice that you that you gave to them? Well, I, I think that, you know, just to take a step back on the perspective of that, I think, you know, the, what happened when you brought that show together was, an, was a perfect representation, say, of, of a community doing a potlatch or whatnot. You know, I think that you're so well respected, you and Dean both in the Indigenous business community, that when people found out you were doing the show, it was all hands on deck. And so when you called and said, just show up here, you know, you're you're one of the people, very few people in my life that when you say show up here at this time, I just come, I don't ask questions, I'm just there. And so that's that's how I arrived on scene. Um, I have zero experience, especially at that time, I have more experience now, but I had zero experience being on television or cameras or anything and my first impression when I when I got to working with the entrepreneurs was I took one look at their faces and thought, oh my God, they don't have any experience in front of a camera either. So if I'm nervous, they're going to be nervous. So I, I had to just block out the fact that there were cameras there at all. And I just focused on the mm -hmm. entrepreneurs and on bringing out their, you know, the reason they became. And I know, I know from experience, every entrepreneur, but also Indigenous entrepreneurs in particular, they come at things for their heart. And they're there to build jobs for the community and bring people bring people up in the world, that hand up in the world. And they need to be seen. And so so I think that um, that it was at your brother's studio, that there was trains going by, was the perfect environment for Indigenous <laughs> entrepreneurs because we could all laugh. Yeah. We could just sit together. And, and, and the production crew was not invasive. They let us you know, do our thing yeah, in terms yeah. of the coaching. Yeah, and it was so obvious that um, when you were on camera, even though you, you looked polished, polished, but knowing just that you spoke from your heart and you were you were speaking to exactly to them like you would, whether or not there was a camera or yeah. not, it's just who you are, right? So Yeah, yeah. so, yeah. and I was so, I, I think that the Bears Lair and what you guys are doing is so incredibly important to, to the Indigenous business community, but to all business communities. And because I work with so many corporations now and I see the effort that they have, I see the impact within the giant corporations of the Indigenous world perspective. And so that is like we're going to have a conversation about a relationship. We're going to touch base on, on how we're doing and we're going to have a laugh because Indigenous people naturally in order to respond to their current environment um, are, are always needing to be in a state of... of of laughter, and, and that's how we are. It's how we deal with hard things. We laugh about it. We support each other. If somebody dies in the community, we all come together and we all lift that family up mm -hmm. so that they can grieve. You know, and that that's a process of moving grief into gratitude. And you yeah. can be damn sure that every single entrepreneur that came on your show had had something in their community. You know, a, a shadow, a pain on their heart, and 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 then they chose to get up. Mm -hmm. You know, and mentors and, and people like Chief Gibby and several other mentors in my life, like my biological mother, uh, Val Napoleon, she got up. You know, they didn't let their past drag them down. They got up. And because they get up, we get up. And and the only way to deal with that is to have a good laugh and, and to reach out and hold hands and say, we're, we've are got our, we're, we're, for, we're facing forward. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. I think I was once told to, after leaving a, a meeting and, and, um, you know, this is when I was in my young years, 20 years ago. <clears throat> and uh, I felt like, oh, my God, he, he keeps making fun of me. And, and, and uh, right, and this was the chief. And, and it's like, because he likes you. 
right? And yeah. if, if they're not making fun of you or poking a joke, then they hate you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we were, we, Chief Gibby was here uh, prior to you, and he's a, a good friend and a mentor to all of us and, and family to all of us. But Dean brought up um, a joke that he had said, and, and I know that we've been in many serious meetings with Chief Gibby Jacob where uh, there's a proponent or a partner or what have you, and whether they broke protocol or said something awkward or what have you, and he would always make them laugh, and he was always – so accommodating, but we were talking about um, the wind farm company that he wanted to start, and he was going to call it Breaking Wind. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> and, he, and he would say that literally as the ice breaker. Yeah. When they had the most <laughs> serious people yeah. around that giant negotiated boardroom table. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think you do have to have a sense of humor. As you were talking about when we were filming with the, just the train going, a pandemic, <laughs> working late hours, and it's just what next right yeah. and it's just you can only you can only support each other um what you're working on right now you have a company called for economics yes yeah, so I've, I've merged uh for our future and then the project that you know we removed the technology that was successful um and our vision uh which is what the project 400 drums brought to us so we are just, uh, and th this is where it's important. So I'm, I'm always my whole life trying to push that what I that glass ceiling, right? W what's next? And and w I can't do anything if I don't know anything. And so I took a private sector job because we had developed these technologies, which I so strongly believed um, are needed in the indigenous economic community uh, that I didn't even want to take any, you know, take the money that would be paid to me. Basically, they couldn't afford me. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> they they couldn't afford me, and the money needed to, needs to stay uh, with that. So, we through partnership, um, through everything I learned, we formed partnerships with four outstanding technology companies that just came like warriors um, to to listen to to what what this was in terms of what the need was in Canada to increase Indigenous spend and preserve Indigenous language and preserve Indigenous art and etc. And so we developed four technologies. In Digi Seal, and so that's the, mm -hmm. the Indigenous lineage and the copywriting. Um, in Digi Slap, which is a mm -hmm. business expansion program in seventy countries that we're bringing to Canada, and then in Digi, Digi Hub. Hub, yeah. And the last one, which is my favorite, and what we're we're actually this is we're tr doing training in this now is called in Digi Speak, and so it's a it's mm -hmm. we we protect the curriculum, the language using the Indigi Seal. And then we bring a artificial intelligence to help. Basically, it becomes the helper to language speakers wow. to easily get all of their curriculum up online. Mm -hmm. And then it's an online platform. is the only one of its kind that creates conversational language speakers. Crazy. So yeah. we're wildly excited about that. And that's, that's launching now. Mm -hmm. Wow. You are phenomenal, Tamara Goddard. All of the things where you came from, who you are, where you're going... And um, the way that you look at the world has always been so inspiring to me. We've been a coach for the kids camps that we've had. And you've taken young, shy kids that you, and teaching these kids camps. We teach kids camps all over Canada. Uh, Bears are Youth Entrepreneur Dream Camps about Indigenous, um, just about business, period, but Indigenous values, culture, um, but social skills, social confidence, um, financial literacy. But you've been um, so I'm so thankful to have you as a coach. I think three times now um, with the kids, and we've done 28. And how you've turned those kids, you've been this mother figure, and and allowed them the space to think differently. Oh yeah. When they feel like they haven't fit in or they don't, a lot of us see uh, math and we see numbers and we just zone out and. That's or they or they or they just freeze up when they public speak. And the way that you look at the world and the way that you allow other people to look, look at the world, yeah, it's how you is phenomenal. It's how you it mix it's like you mix art and math all together. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and that is my artistic style. Literally, mm -hmm. is math in my art. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's the only way. Uh, but it's just, just you know, you can sit with a child and try and show them like a linear math system. But the the trick with with math is that if you show them a, a natural based system of, of how mathematic reflects the world around them, th then all of a sudden people get excited. You know, you, numbers tell a story that is so much more eloquent than any verbal words could ever do. Right. And I, I think, I mean, it's a, what everyone's talking about now is 
you know, the industrial school system that was created, right? How it really doesn't work that well in general, yeah. but particularly not for indigenous people. No, yeah. that's correct. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And, and spatial, mm -hmm. you know, so the art that I do is just a spatial, rep is a ge spatial representation of geometries, mm -hmm. which is math. Like math always has a shape. Mm -hmm. It always has a form. It also that's the synesthesia. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. <laughs> the geometry Synes that goes with the numbers synesthesia. that creates the patterns. Ready? Gina. Uh, synesthesia. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Kazoo tight. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I just, uh, I love this. So if you're an artist, if you're into technology, if you're a math genius, if you're an art genius, if you want to go into entrepreneurism, if you want to put this all together, if you want to join a growing team, all of this is available with for economics and where were people where this is going and, and stay tuned. How can people contact you? How can people find out more or learn more about what you're doing? I'm a pretty easy search on Google, so so just my name with four economics will bring you to my contact details. But I also want to add that that at, at my role, you know, I don't want to depreciate. Ethel Halsey is such an exciting opportunity uh, between the largest facilities management company in Canada and the English River First Nation, and so that will be another area that's really integral. So First Nation suppliers um, for. Any, anything that any, you know, like RBC government buildings, if, if it's a service that is required in any capacity, uh, we'd be, and especially the artists, uh, we're, we're interested to talk to you. And then we'll be building a team. So that entire um, BGIS is the fastest growing facilities management company in Canada. And essentially, they manage 6,000 buildings with a, with a giant AI center. So hmm. they're pretty exciting. I didn't even know the industry existed until I, until I, was contacted by them, but I'm just my head's a bit blown off because mm -hmm. there's so much to it. There's there's <laughs> there's there's I think they spend about a hundred million dollars just on technology to move into into smart uh, smart related industries. Wow, English River First Nations Saskatchewan is it? Yeah, English River yeah. First Nations Saskatchewan, and so we'll be working with BGIS, I believe. To you know, they've just announced that they're doing blue zone buildings, and so they're they're the most environmentally friendly. Um, facilities management firm so anything from landscaping you know on and on janitorial janitorial any we do. kind of food yeah. service food or services, hospitality or coffee. installations of art yeah anything so if you're anybody interested in anything internships please call tamara and get a hold of tamara and she is uh, the vessel in the nucleus for empowerment and elevation and inspiration so Thank you so much for being on our show and being our guest. We got to finally visit yeah. with you yeah, and hope to have you again and, and just continue the story. Thanks so much for tuning in to Beyond the Lair. Follow us, download our episodes, follow us on our socials, Bears Lair TV on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and TikTok. Until next time, live your dream, find your purpose. Mm -hmm.